Willkommen beim Nerds of Law Podcast. Die Nerds of Law, das sind Katharina Bisset und Michael Lanzinger. Wir präsentieren euch Neuigkeiten zu Recht und Technik, spannende Interviews sowie Tipps und Tricks generell zur geekigen Seite des Rechts. Den vergesst nie. Law is the ultimate science. Nerds of Law, Episode 94. Legal Speedboats with Stephanie Everett from The Lawyerist. Hello and welcome everyone to another English episode of the Nerds of Law podcast. And today I'm majorly fangirling here because I've invited Stephanie from The Lawyerist podcast and I've, I think, talked about The Lawyerist and the small firm roadmap about almost every episode so far so it's a great great honor to have you here but Stephanie welcome and tell our audience all about you and lawyerist please well thank you for having me I'm excited to be here and talk to you guys today um, as you mentioned I lead the team here at lawyerist and we have we really do two things if you think about the company one is we try to connect solo and small firm lawyers with the tech and services they need for their business. So you can go to our website and learn all about the different software platforms that are available and we try to help lawyers pick what's going to work best for them. And then the second part of our business is we just help people run a healthier law firm. So we have a lot of content on our website, on the podcast and in the book. And then we have a coaching community for people who want more help. And so I'm one of the coaches in that in that group too. So what's your background? Are you a lawyer? Are you a business person? How did you get to lawyerist in the first place? Yeah, great question. I am a lawyer. I came out of law school actually in 2002. So I think I'm at 20 years now, which is crazy to say out loud. And I started practicing big law, had no idea that I would start my own firm, but really just got this opportunity with a business partner. And we said, yeah, you know what, let's try it and let's do it. And so we launched our own law firm. It was the two of us and we brought along my legal assistant. And honestly, we just had tremendous success. And I was the managing partner. I was the one making sure the business was doing all the things that a business needs to do. And I loved it. I loved that role. Um, my father had owned a business or still owns a business. And so he was sort of my mentor in that journey. And after about seven years, we had grown the team to a team of 20. And I found all these lawyers were coming to me, my colleagues and friends saying, how did you do that? How did you guys build this law <laughs> firm and, and have all this success? And as I was having those conversations, I realized that a lot of lawyers rightfully so, right? We go to law school to learn how to think like a lawyer. No one ever taught us that there's a way to hire people, that there's a way to think about systems and processes oh. in your business. And I said, huh, I think that there's a thing here that I'm going to try to do. So in 2015, that's when I shifted and became a certified coach and really started doing coaching and consulting work, found my way to lawyerist. And here I am. That is an interesting move, and um, we've talked before we started recording. That's basically how Michael and I met. When I just wrote Michael, so how are you doing it? And yeah, you never learn how to go out on your own, especially in big law, because they don't want you to leave. They want you to be dependent on a battery of assistants and paralegals and whatever. So, like you said before, in lawyers, well, you're you're running a business, you're coaching, uh, but you also do a podcast, which is for free. So how did how did that start? Yeah, I mean, I I have to nod uh, to my business partners, Sam and Aaron. They actually started the podcast almost eight years ago. Now we just hit episode four hundred of our Whoa. show. I know it's Very amazing. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I really inherited this show and started working on it when I joined the team in 2018. Um, at that point, it had been around for a while. And the show really is designed to help lawyers think about their business. We try to bring in guests maybe outside the legal arena, people that expose our audience to different ideas. I mean, yesterday I recorded an episode with a neuroscientist on anxiety and how anxiety cool can be good for you, right? There's a way to harness the power and use it in a productive way instead of just a destructive way. So we try to introduce our audience to lots of ideas that they can really benefit from as business owners. 
spoiler to our podcast listeners, we didn't come up with the idea to drag in people from other professions. We kind of, well, stole that. We got inspired by you. So what is it like? Was it hard for you to get people from the non-legal profession into your podcast or to have lawyers listen to non-lawyers? Uh, I don't think so. It's People seem to be pretty open to it. Um, I think the the guests appreciate the work that we're doing and sometimes they'll make a lawyer a joke, but usually they don't and they, they realize that they can be helpful <laughs> to the audience. Um, the audience seems to enjoy the the show as well. I mean, we do get some feedback sometimes, which we, we listen to. I tell everyone, if we could do something different or better, or if there's a topic that you don't feel like we're addressing, let us know. Um, but mostly we really try to be thoughtful about our audience when we're thinking about the show and who we want to have on the show. And I'm always asking the team, you know, how is this going to help a lawyer? Like maybe this was a cool book. Yeah. Maybe this was a great author or there's people doing interesting work. But how does this help our larger audience? And I think if you keep that in mind, then it's helpful and makes the show work. I hope. Yes, yes, I do think so. I've been, I've been with it, uh, like I said, long before I became uh, a lawyer, long before I went out on my own. Um, it's always the secret: how do you keep a podcast alive, and how do you keep motivated for so many, for so many episodes? What I also found very interesting on your podcast is the way you deal with advertisements, because that's always a thing um, that some podcasts deal with badly. We still don't have any. Shout out if anyone wants to pay us money. You know, um, you know we've we've stayed clear so far, um, but I think it's really cool how you actually bring the people who advertise with you onto the podcast, just have a talk with them. Um, I thought that was actually really interesting, and I find myself sticking around for those conversations as well. Whereas with other advertisements, I tend to just skip them if there's just a you know two minute advertising. Um, how do you get that idea? Yeah, we're always experimenting and trying new things. And we work with so many great advertisers who have thought leaders on their team and they have content. They understand, you know, what they're doing. If, they, if they're if they selling marketing to law firms, then they obviously understand how marketing works, mm -hmm. right? And same thing. I mean, you could that applies to anyone. If you're a virtual receptionist company, then you probably have good ideas on how you should set up your intake or how you should answer calls and handle call volume. And so we think and we know from our own sales process that it works best if you really teach people teach them these ideas and they'll trust you and they'll believe you and they'll come to you then to help them solve those problems and our advertisers are on board with that philosophy they agree to it and so it really works well because and I, i'm really appreciative of what you said because it is nice to hear that yes, if, if we can have a partner come on and really teach our audience about this topic, in the end, people will buy from them. But you don't have to come on and just sell. You, you really can come, yeah. you know, flip the switch and say, okay, let's just provide helpful information. And then at the end, we can give a little plug for what it is we're doing. Yeah, I mean, we've we've had people who have legal tech software, etc., um, on the show, and we just talked to them and how they came to be, um, even though we haven't been paid for it. Uh, but that was kind of the idea behind it, because we at the beginning of the part we wanted to do it a little bit more reviews and plug software ourselves. But then I thought, but actually, we'd like to know how they came to do that, how they started their business, and and all these things. Um, but starting the business, one of the things that I worked through, and I've actually already worked through it twice in the almost two years that I've been out on my own, uh, the Small Firm Roadmap, the book that I um, suggest to everyone going out on their own. Do you want to tell us a bit about it and why I called it a workbook? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So our book is the Small Firm Roadmap, and we wrote it as a help guide, right? We wrote it to say, this is the things that law school didn't teach you. And what if we could give lawyers a roadmap, truly, that's where the book got its name, to how to think about your business and how to build your business. And so the first part of the book, part one, 
sets out some larger ideas we have about why we think the traditional practice of law is broken. We think it, you know, not much has changed for many firms in the way that they operate for the last couple of hundred years. And yet look around, our world has really changed. I mean, I sit on my bed and dial up whatever show I want to watch on Netflix and use my iPad to order groceries and they get delivered to my front door. And yet my lawyer is sending me a paper invoice in the mail and wants me to write a check and find a stamp (laughs) and an envelope and mail it back to them. Right. And I was like, there's a disconnect here. So part one, we sort of set out why we think lawyers need to think about their business as a business But then we didn't want to just leave you with that. So part two is where we really break down all the parts of your business from strategy to building a team to marketing and delivering client services, you know, profits, and then the systems and and finally the owner. And we really try to give you a step by step guide to how to start implementing those things in your business. Yeah, and that's actually why I had to work through it because I went through it once before I started off and there were some things that were just going over the top of my head. I was like, okay, I cannot deal with that just yet. And obviously things like staffing weren't an issue back then. But then eventually I went back to it and took the test on your website again. And um, and what I actually found really interesting is that you do focus on small law firms um why is that i mean you can't say you come from big law and many of us had an experience like that is that the reason why you focus on small law firms do the big ones not need it yeah they got plenty of help there's plenty of overpriced (laughs) consultants that they can call on (laughs) um (laughs) I mean, the small firm market is a little bit forgotten. I mean, as I said, I started my own practice and at its height, you know, we had a team of 20. So we were still a small law firm. And as a as an owner and manager of a small firm, I often felt sort of alone, like a lot of the materials, a lot of the resources that were out there on running a business, a a law firm were aimed towards those larger firms. If I could get all kinds of stats about what they were doing for their marketing and how they were, you know, what they were paying people, but that just didn't apply to me at all. It just felt so irrelevant. So one, I think we definitely saw the need to focus on this, on the smaller firms, but honestly, we say this in the book too. It's, it's just more fun. Uh, If you think about the analogy of a speedboat versus a ocean liner, you know, that carries all the containers from your area to me. Um, So the analogy works, you know, the analogy works because with a small law firm, they can make decisions, they can move fast, they can shift gears and take their business in a whole new direction. And quite frankly, quite frankly, that's just more fun for us. Like we think the real changes the real innovation in business are going to come from small law firms. Cheers to that. I think that's what we've been preaching or doing. And I remember when I was still in big law and Michael was on his own and we were at a legal tech conference together and there was a software I wanted to try. Um, and I was like, I'm, it's going to take months and months till I can try that, getting it through all the levels of whatever who needs to agree to this so I went to Michael and said Michael buy this I want to try it <laughs> and he did nice <laughs> so that was good she, she didn't work uh, with me at the time she just said buy it because I will work with you soon because she she got my uh, I don't know what, what what's what's to say it's, it's not a paralegal it's a concipient I, I don't know Katarina associate I think yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the best. Associates, associate. But you listened. You, <laughs> you just said, okay, I'll do it. Well, I learned very quickly to better listen to Katarina. That's, that's... And, and who really was the boss. But yeah, we're, we're enjoying it. And I think <laughs> um, I've struggled so often in, in bigger firms trying to get anything techy done or anything changed. And eventually you just give up and go out on your own. Um, plus, those people who leave big law firms usually start off in a small law firm. So there you go, you're back to that. Um, But another aspect that I think gets ignored way too often 
in our education because I think it really already starts in law school and being a lawyer that you have a big focus on a healthy law firm and I find that um, it's too much praise to be burnt out to be working a metric shit ton of hours and really being really miserable about it um how did you come to that conclusion or why is that such a big focus for you as well yeah we were really looking at our business model that we have here at lawyerist and what we wanted to teach for law firms and we were able to really summarize it around this idea of a healthy firm and you know we're like for the healthy firm to work you do need a healthy strategy team clients profit systems and a healthy owner and all of those things come together to really make the business work too many i think you see a couple of things so like it's always easy to talk about what's what it's not right one thing is there are people out there that focus way too much on money and everything is about money. And that's the end all be all. That's the the only measure of success is money. And we saw that, quite frankly, like it kind of turned us off a little bit, right? Like that's not, healthy profits is a part of our model. And for sure, you need to make money as a business. You need to be profitable. I mean, we're seeing this in America a lot right now. I don't know with you guys, but corporate profits are insane. Yeah. And we really see that it's the corporations that are benefiting and they're not reinvesting in their people. They're, you know, they're not reinvesting in their and the systems and the business and it's a real problem. So that one of our ideas is that you can have a healthy business that can achieve financial success, but the emphasis the the whole thing doesn't have to be wrapped around money. And so that was one important piece for us. Yes, I yeah, know. S- sounds Earth dramatic. shattering. I know. I, I, I love those guests who start killing dogmas off one by one. Yeah. And like you said, like lawyers as a profession are terribly unhealthy. We wear the busyness, the overwhelm, the stress and the anxiety. We We do wear that as a badge of honor. Like you're like, that's what we're supposed to aspire to be. And honestly, that's just... BS, right? Like, that's terrible. You can, you should be healthy. Like, why are we doing this to kill ourselves? Literally, I have people that I connect with, and they think they've told me like, they're worried that any day they're gonna drop dead of a heart attack. Like, great. What? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What is the point? And so we've really built an emphasis in our community and with the people that we work with, on how can you create a business that allows you to live the life that you want to live, where you are healthy, where you're spending time with your family, with those relationships that matter to you. I have one lawyer who's a photographer and he wants to spend time on his craft and be creative. I have another lawyer that wants to work half the year from the beach, um, actually near you in Spain, right? They want to travel and see I love the world American and... distances like other side of the <laughs> continent totally near you like right around the corner <laughs> I know like we just want to come hang out with you is is the bottom line is we all want to be there <laughs> so so we're trying to figure out how do we make that happen could you still have a business and run it from another location of course the answer is absolutely technology makes all those things possible today and so we've really kind of flipped the switch on what are we thinking of as our business and what what do we really want? And, and that should be the number one priority. And so we take it from a very individual approach where we ask each person we work with, you know, what does it mean for you to be successful? Then let's build that. Because don't just buy into some, you know, rich guy's idea that it's all about money and private jets or I don't even know what rich people do, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know either. I mean, having money is good, and we want to make money. It just shouldn't be the only purpose in life, I think. Yes, and I think there's a generational shift as well. And I think it started with our generation 
where I mean, there's there's still people our age who really go for that big firm partner or whatever thing. Um, but what I've um, thought about more and more, I think there's even more pressure in the US about the whole money aspect because of this whole student loan thing, which we really don't have to that extent. Um, so you don't end up going to law school, having to be indebted for the rest of your life, it feels like. Um, I mean, from yeah. our point of view, it's like the mind boggles just hearing those stories and reading about it, which I think doesn't really help with the whole money pressure thing. Yeah, you guys have definitely got some things figured out that we need to work on. I mean, one thing I noticed when I vacationed there, you know what you don't see a lot of in Europe? Mini storage units. Do you know this? In the US, we have every corner you go to now, there's these huge buildings that are storage units because Americans have so much stuff that we can't even hold it all in our houses. And so we go and we rent a storage unit to hold more things. I mean, they do exist, but I think even in Vienna, there may be like three or four or something like that that you use if you're going abroad for a year or something, maybe. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, sometimes it might make sense to use them if you're moving. We had to use one temporarily once when we were moving. So there is a reason that they should exist. But here, there's so many of them. And I know so many people that just, we just have so much stuff. I don't know. Now we're getting off on a different topic. But um, maybe our whole idea of a healthy firm just kind of stems from this place of it's time to rethink what it is we're trying to build yes but it's a whole it's a systematic thing and just because we don't have huge student loans and mortgages around that doesn't mean our attorney lifestyle is any healthier so um but what i'd be interested in you said no one tells you about how to do the business things so what do you think is missing in the education in law schools in the states what do you think, what would be the things that law students should study or should learn in law school? Yeah, we're starting to see some law schools offer some programs in law school around how to build a business. So certainly law students would benefit from learning about clients. I mean, everybody, no matter what firm you go to, there's some expectation that you're going to market your services and sell your services. And so there could be some work that we do around what does that look like and how do we do that? Um, not everybody needs to learn how to hire, but if you're going to run your own business, you you should understand certain aspects about hiring. But I do think, I guess I'll back up and say, I do think all lawyers would benefit from learning around about business strategy. Why does a business exist? I used to teach a class here at a local law school that I just made up. They gave they gave me permission to make up my own class. And I went in and I taught the students about the economics of a law firm. This is how a law firm makes money. This is what the f law firm needs to be successful. And these students' minds were blown. Like they had never considered the financial implications of the work that they were going to be doing. And most of these students probably were going to big law firms. And so I did teach it from that perspective. But it was very interesting that, you know, we asked lawyers to graduate from law school and go contribute to these businesses, but they really don't understand fundamentally what that means. They hear this word like make partner. And I, and I asked them, like, do you know what it means, at least for most law firms, to, to be a partner, to be an equity owner of a business? And they would tell you, no, they don't understand that you have a financial risk, that if the business doesn't make money, you as the owner may need to put up more money. You may need to invest your personal capital into the business. These are foreign concepts yeah. to a lot of lawyers because they think we're lawyers. We didn't go to business school or we don't need to know numbers. I think that's pretty silly. Like you should understand how you're contributing to the overall success of the business. Yes, because it feels also like when you're negotiating your salary or something like that, it was like, oh, you get x thousand dollars euros whatever a year and you need to bring in that much revenue and your hourly rates are this and that and sometimes it just feels like those are made up numbers when you know when we're, especially when we're watching u.s shows and those are numbers and we're like what 
the heck? If I'd make that much in revenue, I'd go out on my own. I would not share that much money. Um, and, and that's just that's just really nuts. And then again, back to the health, you don't know how to spend it. But yeah, but that's really, really cool that uh, that you get to teach that. So do you have the feeling there are more law schools who are opening their doors to those kind of ideas and a bit more of a business sense? I hope so. I mean, for sure, some are. Honestly, it's also one of those systemic problems. Unfortunately, um, here we have something, the U.S. News and World Report. It's a mag, you know, magazine that always comes out with their rankings of the law schools. And so everybody wants to be in the top 10 or the top half or whatever, you know, these rankings matter to the law schools because they <laughs> use that ranking to attract students. Yeah. And unfortunately, the way the rankings work right now they discount lawyers graduating from law school and starting their own practice. And so when they're when they're uh-huh. looking at employment rates, they they measure the success of a law f- school based on how many of their graduates go to work at a law firm. And they discount that idea of a solo practice or or a lawyer launching their own practice. And so it sounds crazy, but that is then influencing I think the law school curriculum that they don't have an incentive to encourage people to open their own law firms after graduating in fact and and maybe I would say there's some benefit to going and working at another law firm before you launch your own because you know oftentimes at least for me when I was a first year lawyer I didn't even know how to file anything with the court or who to mail what to and our system is really because we don't have that apprenticeship system like you have in the yeah. medical field you know you really we've got five years of that oh after see we don't have any <laughs> yeah you just you get your license and you're done you can go do whatever and I think we're really missing that apprentice piece where you learn how to practice law and so because of that the law schools aren't teaching these skills because they don't want people to necessarily go out and start practicing on their own right away and then if you've started at a law firm and then you go out on your own well now you're kind of off their radar plus if they have got close ties to big law firms they obviously want the best and the brightest to come join them and not know how to file a lawsuit yeah. or something They're- like that but yeah we we do have we do have 5 years after law school of apprenticeship but um, if you do all those five years, you do a part, I think, up to I think seven, eight months in court. Um, but if you do the rest of that in a big law firm, you'll never know how to file anything either. Mm. So it's um, and that's what we're talking about a lot uh, about how to go out on your own. That at least, you know, because I think even if you're in a bigger law firm, it helps knowing about the business because you'll be a better employee. You'll be a better partner one day. Um, but and then then coming back obviously uh, to you uh, you've just redone um, your website and one of the things that I look for every year is the the rankings and best law firm websites of course um, and to to find inspiration there Uh, and that's something that a lot of lawyers completely ignore they have this boilerplate this is the team. Those are our special fields. These are the things we published and send us an email. I think that's about yeah. it. Um, but you've got great, uh, great examples how to do it differently on your website as well. I think that's really yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you. We, we, I always look forward to that as well. Nominations usually open up right after the first of the year. So be on the lookout for that. And you can self-nominate your website or you can nominate somebody else's that you think is great. And then usually we make those announcements in March or early spring. Yeah, I'm, I think if it only just recently um, came came out in summer, uh, and yeah, but you did redo your own website as well, and now you've got a lot of resources uh, for law firms that uh, they go beyond the book as so on. They well, they're not just techie things, but they touch on a whole lot different fields from what I've seen I haven't read them all yet I have to admit (laughs) there's a lot there so yeah you're right if you could go to our website we have a ton of resources Um, the newest thing on the 
on the newly launched site are are our small firm guides. So these are like mini versions of the book on very specific topics. So we have one on legal tech, law firm marketing, law firm website design, pricing, finances, hiring, managing a team, how to start a law firm if you're just getting going. So I definitely would recommend that as a great place if you're new to us and trying to figure out something about your business. Um, just go there and check it out. You can read it on the website or you can download it as a PDF, which is super helpful. Yes, absolutely. I've, I've downloaded them all. I haven't got through them all yet, unfortunately, but like with the book, I'm sure I will. Um, there's a holiday coming up, so that's good. Um, so what's what's next for the lawyers? What are your, your upcoming projects? Anything you can talk about already? Um, I mean, we're going to keep working on what we're doing and making it better. So we'll be updating those guides all the time. So you can always come back and, and see what's new there. We're going to, we're writing a few new guides. Um, I guess actually I can give you guys the biggest sneak peek is I'm writing the next version of the book as we speak. Yay. So there'll be a new edition coming out. Some things that we want to update and revise. Look for that early next year, I hope. Um, very cool. I don't know. I got to got to work on it today. It's like what I do every day now. It's it's it's, it's hard work. But I So uh where shall we transfer the money to? Do you have a bank account or something? Like pre-order. Yes, we should take pre-orders. That's a great idea. Why hadn't I thought of that? Most I'll make sure. Kickstarter. Lawyer starter. No. Uh forget. But yes, I'm very much looking forward to that. So I think I will wait then till the beginning of next year which is a good idea to do the third round and i'll do that then with the help of the next book that's that's excellent but um michael and i together with a couple of friends we launched a law firm startup book in in german this year and i need to update then the link to to the lawyers because obviously it's in there as a to read the. <laughs> so but that's great news and i'm very much looking forward to that but what i also have to ask because I always want to buy new stuff and I know you recommend a lot of um, things on your podcast but for you personally what's your favorite software or hardware the things that you couldn't work or live without ah, it's such a tough question so I do like I don't know there's so many out there and you know you use the tools in different ways um I personally get excited when I get to use my creative side. And so I realized recently, like I really enjoy Canva, which I know has been around for a long time yeah. and probably everybody knows it now, but being able to create beautiful marketing materials and presentations, I just started playing with a video creation tool called doodly it's also been around for a while, but I was able to create this fun little animated video for LabCon, which is our conference. And I was, you know, I was able to do it in just a couple of hours. And I was thinking to myself, this is pretty remarkable because normally this would have taken, I would have had to pay thousands of dollars to get an animated video created. Yeah. And this, they just have a whole bunch of templates and you move the little people around and then it creates this video and it was amazing. So I think it's always fun when you can do things like that and and have and have fun with the tools right there's lots of tools that we just need because you have to have them so i guess i like the tools right now that make it fun to create something that sounds like a great thing and a great balance i think as well uh that you need but i love these things where you can animate videos super super cheaply even if you get the commercially used version it's about a tenner a month or something um that's like way beyond anything you would have to pay someone to do that but now i'm looking over michael who's heavily writing his notes is there because you haven't uh have you started listening on the podcast yet i know if i'm going to call you out now and i've sent keep sending you links about individual episodes you must listen to are you still behind on the podcast? It's a problem with 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 timing, but I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm still behind. And now I've 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 been able to 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 listen to both of you talk and to also to to, to uh, share some information. I think um, it's another incentive for me to to actually listen to the podcast. I've also uh, 
for the, the, the questions for this podcast, uh, look looked up again uh, on, on your website. And I think, as uh, Katharina said, holiday is coming up, a journey is coming up where we both will be going. Uh, so I think I have plenty of time to read and why not some lawyerist stuff? Good. That's nice that we managed to hook you now as well. <laughs> and since I'm yeah. driving by car, I can catch up on the episodes. I think I'm about 10 episodes behind, but that's what car drives are, rides are for. Exactly. You're you're all good. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And, and let me know if you're a new listener, or if you guys get caught up, um, would love to hear from you and connect with you and hear what's helpful, or if there's different topics you'd love us to cover. You know, I, I tell everyone like I'm a real person. I'm just here. So I'm here to listen and 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 help in any way that we can. Yes. Oh, yes. And I do need to mention that. Sorry, for those of our listeners who want to start on the lawyerist, you can actually really go back and listen to old episodes. They don't go out of style and they're still relevant. And if you go back 200, 300 episodes, you'll still find. Um, I think when I went back the first time, I just I picked the ones where the titles were like, oh, I need to listen to that. I need to listen to that. But yeah, I think that's also cool in a podcast where you can go back and they're just as relevant then as they're now. Um, and that's a very, um, very great thing you, you achieved there. Thank you. Who do you prefer, uh, Batman or Iron Man? Oh, I hope I get this right. I like Iron Man. There's no ri right or wrong answer. <laughs> Obviously, if you say Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Like, like. Like Katarina is Team Iron Man and I'm more like Team Batman, but it's it's very interesting how how the people on our podcast answer. It, there would have been other answers if you say, well, I I don't know. Now she Hulk, I think. Harvey Specter or Ellie McBeal, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Matlock or Perry Mason. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If my daughter were here, she would probably give us all a, a lecture on why we're missing the most obvious choice. You know. Mm -hmm. um, Oh. I don't know. Like, I, I'd be curious to see, like, her favorite. I think she's, but she's down with all the Marvel. And, I mean, like, I know I'm switching gears, but in the Star Wars world, like, I love Ray. I love that we have so many strong women characters coming out now. I haven't watched that new, there's a new thing out, She-Hulk, about a woman lawyer. Oh, I've watched that. It's hilarious. I've, we've watched the first episode. It's really great and it's really a lot of fun. And my husband was actually like, oh, I totally need to watch that. I totally need to watch that. It's like, you're not getting enough grumpy lawyer at home. <laughs> but okay, we'll watch that. Yeah, I want to see it. So I'll check it out. But I'm excited that there's just more voices and more, you know, more women for, for our daughters and sons to, to watch. So that's exciting. I became a, an attorney despite growing up on Matlock, so... There you go. I, I, I did not let the gray suit deter me. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for coming and sharing your experience and hopefully hooking a lot of our listeners to your podcast as well. Getting a, getting a voice to the recommendations I've been making for ages now. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. I love talking with you guys. And um, yeah, th yeah, just thank you. It's been great. Danke, dass ihr beim Nerds of Law Podcast zugehört habt. Auf unserer Webseite nerdsoflaw.com könnt ihr das Impressum, Datenschutzinformationen und viele spannendere Dinge finden. Dieser Podcast ist durch eine Creative Commons by Non-Commercial 4.0 International License geschützt. Das bedeutet, ihr dürft den Podcast kopieren, mit Freunden teilen, mit der Information, wo der Podcast herkommt und ihn nicht für kommerzielle Zwecke verwenden. Das Urheberrecht für die Musik liegt bei Mick Bourdais. Ihr findet seine Webseite unter mickbourday.com. Live long and prosper. Eure Nerds of Law. <lacht>